is too complex and can be overwhelming for patients and their families who are facing a serious illness or injury. The Tri-State Advocacy Project helps patients identify and obtain health insurance and government benefits, assist families in obtaining needed services and supports to help patients to continue living safely in their homes and sharing information on other community resources. All of the services provided by the Tri-State Advocacy Program are free of charge. So we would like to welcome Cindy Clark to tonight's webinar. Cindy? Hi, thanks everybody. I'm sorry I am not on video. My camera did not cooperate on my iPad. Um, so uh, just a little bit of information, additional information about some of the things that we do. Um, we also do social security disability applications. Uh, we help with patients who need community health choices, getting through that whole process. And we also help with things like um, finding resources if someone needs housing or uh, needs more modifications than what the uh, community health choices will provide. So um, I will just skip if it's okay with you. I'm just going to skip over to um, Medicare. Um, I think we all know that the anxiety and worries that uh, we all go through when this, during the initial stages of this injury can be very overwhelming. Um, apparently there was a very big interest in Medicare and Medicare, although is very good program, there are the limitations that people face, um, which makes it very difficult to get all the services that they need. Uh, if anyone is on Medicare, and as you come up to the Medicare open enrollment period, you're going to find your mailbox uh, shoved full of all these Medicare plans that you can join. Some are going to tell you that you're going to get a free gym membership, etc. So there's basically two types of Medicare. There's Medicare original which is your A for hospitalization, skilled nursing facilities, your B, which is your physician services, tests, et cetera, and then D, which is your prescription drug coverage. People also have the option of getting what's known as Medicare Part C, and that is Medicare that is run through a managed Medicare provider, AmeriHealth, Keystone, Personal Choice, any of those. Uh, there's pros and cons to both, and I think that a lot of it depends on the individual situation. For example, if someone would like to go and have a uh, surgery or a procedure done at the Mayo Clinic, they take regular Medicare. However, they probably are not going to take your Medicare Advantage plan. So with the Medicare Advantage plans, Part C, you're limited to in-network providers and there will be, uh, people should check because there is a list of providers who are in-network. Uh, you may not find the hospitals that you want to go to in that network. And if it is not, I recommend that you just pass that one by. Um, I've had my own personal experience um, someone came to, when my mother was still alive, somebody came to the house and told her, oh, you should join Bravo. It's not going to cost you anything and you're going to get to go to the gym. And my mother was blind, <laughs> so I don't think she was going to the gym. And it was really frustrating trying to tell her, no, you don't want that. And, you know, oh, this is what he told me. This is what he told me. So it's a very frustrating experience. Uh, part D is the prescription drug coverage. If you take any types of medications, you should review your Part D coverage on an, at least on an annual basis. Um, they change frequently, the drugs change frequently, and the costs change frequently. Medicare runs a pro, uh, website, medicarepartd.gov, and it allows you to go in, uh, put in your zip code, 
uh, tell about which pharmacies you prefer to go to, and list all of your drugs. And it'll then pull up all the plans that are available in your area and how much they cost. So for some people, uh, they think that they've purchased the play, a plan that's great and they go in there and check and they find out that uh, they could have saved hundreds of dollars a month because a particular uh, medication that they take is on one formulary list but not on another. So it's something that really should, you should do. Uh, if you take a particular medication that's very expensive and difficult to get coverage for because it is not available in generic form, I recommend that people go to the manufacturer's websites and get a patient assistance forms. Uh, they are required, each drug manufacturer, and I know this for sure because my daughter works at Johnson & Johnson, uh, they are all required to have patient assistance programs. So if you are in a position where something is very expensive, definitely look into the options of getting it directly through uh, that company's patient care. Um, individuals are eligible for Medicare when they turn 65, when they've been on social security disability for two years, if anyone's been uh, diagnosed with end-stage renal disease or ALS, they are all immediately eligible for Medicare. One of the problems that most people face with Medicare is that 20% copay. 20% uh, of, a, of a power wheelchair can be an outlandish cost that most people can't afford. 20% of a prosthetic can be out of the reach for a lot of people. But there are options. And this is where I have my highest level of frustration. If somebody calls the county assistance office and says, I have Medicare, but I'm having a really hard time paying my medical bills. Is there any chance that I can get Medicaid? And I don't know how many times people have been told, no, you cannot have Medicare and Medicaid. Well, that is absolutely not true. You can have both, but you have to fit the coverage criteria. If you are very low income, you are considered a qualified Medicare beneficiary. And with the low income, you will get full medical assistance benefits and Medicaid will pay your Part B premium. There are other ways to get Medicaid, uh, basically a lot of times going through what I consider the back door. If someone is under the age of 65, uh, Pennsylvania has a program called Medical Assistance for the Working Disabled. And under uh, Medical Assistance for the Working Disabled, you can have a much higher income limit the state only requires you to work a couple of hours a month at any type of job, and you will qualify for medical assistance, Medicaid. I have two brothers that are on MAUD, and both of them watch my dogs on weekends. So I pay them each $15 a weekend, and then they qualify for full medical assistance under MAUD. Um, it's a really good program. Uh, there's generally something somebody can do, uh, check their mother, uh, balance somebody's checkbook, sell some things on eBay, anything at all that you can do to get a little bit of income. The amount of income you receive, because it's so minimal, is not going to affect your social security disability benefits. And the individual who is paying you if it's under $200 for the year, they do not have to issue you a 1099 and they do not have to take out taxes. So that is one really good way to get uh, medical assistance as a Medicare beneficiary. Uh, the second way to get it is through uh, the community health choices. And under community health choices, the Medicaid limit looks only at the individual who is getting the services 
and the assets are determined based on um, what they call nursing facility um, assets. If you look at just the general guidelines, it will say $8,000 for an individual, $10,000 for a couple. But there are ways that they uh, check it in a different manner. They look at it the same way they do at somebody who is going into a facility. Uh, just because they don't want to impoverish what is known as the community spouse. Um, the other thing with Medicaid, uh, for any child, anybody under the age of 21, that is, Medicaid is governed by state law, or I'm sorry, by federal law. And it's under the EPSDT category, which most of us know if we have kids, uh, the Vaccine Act. Under that law, the Medicaid must provide any service that a child needs, even if that service is not in the regular Medicaid for that state. So a child who needs um, private duty nursing for 12, 15 hours a day, needs personal care services, anything at all that the child needs must be provided. It's pretty black and white as far as what the federal government goes. Uh, we are fortunate in Pennsylvania. Uh, there are very few states that do this, uh, but if you have someone who's under 21 and has an injury, or if you work in the field, um, and you do work with um, adults or um, anyone over 18, children, uh, I highly recommend that you do the uh, PH95 application. The parent's income and resources are disregarded. So the child qualifies strictly on their own. And this form of Medicaid will get them through till they, are, till they turn 21. So they basically should have any service that they need. Um, what we typically do is, as soon as the uh, individual is coming close to 18, 19, we sign them up for community health choices, just so we have no breaks in coverage. Um, the other thing about Medicaid, uh, which is very important, and only 39 states in the United States um, expanded Medicaid under Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Pennsylvania did not initially uh, take on Medicaid under that form until Governor Corbett was going for reelection and it was a big issue among a lot of individuals. So he did add it on to our state. Uh, under Medicaid for just coming in through the Affordable Care Act, they do not look at resources. They only look at the household income. And this becomes especially important when someone is in the hospital after an injury and they can't afford their COBRA premiums or their insurance is gonna run out in a short period of time. Um, usually before pre-COVID, um, I would get to see a lot of patients while they were still in the acute care trauma center. And one of the first things I did was sign everybody up for Medicaid because generally uh, they've lost their income. They are not gonna get social security disability for at least six months. And you know we don't want them to be without health insurance coverage. Uh, Pennsylvania also has something which is very important and it's called HIPP, H-I-P-P, -P, Health Insurance Premium Payments. So what, they, so what we generally do is uh, if a case manager or someone calls me and says, um, we know that this person's only gonna have their health insurance coverage till October 1st, I quickly sign them up for Medicaid. I enroll them in the HIPP program. So that way the state will pay the COBRA premium for that individual. And COBRA, uh, due to a disability, will go anywhere from 24 to 36 months. 
So it benefits the family because they do have the private insurance. It benefits providers because they are getting the higher reimbursement rate through, uh, through private insurance. And it also gives people a second level of coverage. If there's something they need that may not be covered under their private insurance, they will have Medicaid as a backup. Um, it's, this program is not used nearly as much as it should be. Um, I get very frustrated when I find out that someone has recently lost their coverage and this uh, hospital or the rehab is trying to discharge them and we have no place to go for equipment or any type of services. Uh, one of the things that I do as an organization in these types of situations if a case manager or care manager calls me and tells me that someone is going to lose their health insurance um, because they cannot afford their COBRA premium, we will pay that COBRA premium for that month because I do not under any circumstances want to see someone uh, not have options for discharge. Uh, so I'll pay the COBRA premium, immediately sign them up for Medicaid, and then immediately sign them up for the health insurance premium payment program. And that way they'll have that continuity of coverage for at least the next 24 months until their Medicare would kick in. Uh, this is something that um, I don't think is very well known out there. So if you do, if you are a provider and you run into families that are facing this issue, please, I beg you to have them call me. Um, I just want to make sure that people go home uh, with some services that they need. So once we have somebody on Medicaid, uh, it makes the community health choices process a little bit easier. Community Health Choices is another form of Medicaid, and it's Medicaid for long-term care in the community. Um, under this program, only the individual who is going to get the services, only their income matters. If the family has children under 18, they do not look at resources. And a lot of times, depending on what the resources are, uh, we can either do a spend down if there's not a whole lot to be spent down. Uh, if they have money in a 401k, it could possibly go into a special needs trust and it won't count against them as an asset. Uh, there's a lot of options to get people into community health choices. Um, and as you know, community health choices varies in different er the uh, managed care companies that are the community health choice providers. Uh, they do vary in different counties. Um, for example, Keystone First, um, which is one of my usual go-tos, uh, has a great uh, provider network in the Philadelphia, Montgomery, Bucks, Delaware, and Chester counties. Uh, but if you go with other, other managed care companies like UPMC, you may not have all of those choices. Uh, so when someone is going through this process, I carefully look at all the providers they want to go to, uh, the hospitals or the rehab centers that they are planning to go to, and make sure they are all covered under this program. Uh, community Health Choices offers a lot for individuals. Uh, besides getting the Medicaid, uh, you can get up to $15,000 in either home or vehicle modifications. Uh, it includes assistive technology, and it also includes specialized assistive technology. Um, I recently got somebody a standing frame under the specialized assistive technology uh, because it typically would not be covered under Medicaid and it was really needed. This person had a lot of issues with blood clots, and we wanted to be sure that they at least were able to be um, in a vertical position for a good part of the day. 
Uh, the other assistive technology that has been very important under um, community health choices is some type of system where people can uh, use voice activation, uh, the ring video doorbells, anything like that. Um, it gives a lot of satisfaction that you'll know uh, when you go to work that the, the person you're leaving is not going to be stuck. Uh, they're going to know who's coming to the door. If they fall, they're going to be able to call 911 and just tell Alexa, call 911, um, change the channel, put on my music, do basically everything except cook your dinner. Um, so that is a really good part of the community health choices uh, services. Another reason why I really push for Medicaid is therapy benefits. Um, and um, Beth, you could go to the next one for private insurance. So under private insurance, private health insurance that most of us have, you go into the hospital, none of us ever read our certificate of coverage. That is everything that is covered by the policy. Uh, if someone in your HR department is the one who chooses the policy, they are looking for payment of simple ordinary expenses, um, visits to your family physician, um, ER charges, things like that. They don't look at the more complicated things that go along with the catastrophic injury or illness. And that's where a lot of patients' problems come in. Uh, so one of the first things I do when I start working with a family is I obtain a copy of their certificate of coverage. And that way I know, first of all, how they describe medical necessity. And I also know limitations, exclusions, deductibles, co-pays, out-of-pocket maximums, and the appeal process because I can guarantee you at some point we are gonna face all of those things. Um, limitations in the policy. Uh, the, the worst limitation in uh, people's policies right now are the very short benefits for PTOT speech. There are policies that only have 20 visits. Uh, there are policies that all three combined can only go to 60 or 80 visits. Um, it's become a very big issue with insurers. And they did this after Medicare started to put limitations on therapy benefits. Uh, Medicare eventually dropped them because it was such an unpopular thing, but the private health insurers have left them. And the limitations that are on the policy uh, for uh, PT or OT, that's pretty much for a person who has a knee replacement and is only going to need maybe 20 uh, PT visits. It really is not anything that's significant uh, for anyone who has a very serious injury. Um, and that's where it's important to get either Medicaid or the community health choices. And this also has a lot to do with an inpatient hospital stay. So if I look at the certificate of coverage and I find out that a person is only going to get 30 PT visits, uh, their policy year runs from January 1st till December 31st, and it's the middle of February, uh, they are not going to have enough physical therapy they're going to regress. Uh, a lot of bad things are going to happen to them. So that's why I really push to get them on Medicaid. The other thing with the limitations is at discharge. If your doctor and um, the other treating uh, therapies, therapists, et cetera, feel that you are not ready for discharge, uh, that you can still make a lot more gains, the insurance company will generally write a letter that says that you can make the same gains on an outpatient basis. And that's pretty much sends up red flags for me and I have red hair so it probably makes it, my hair even redder. 
but it's really upsetting because I look at the policy and they've only got 20 PT visits. They're never going to get that coverage. They're never going to make those gains. So that is one of the reasons that I always use in the appeal procedure. I tell the insurer right away, your policy only covers X number of visits, and this is not significant enough for this patient to make the kind of gains that they can make. Um, it works very well. It usually does lengthen the inpatient hospital stay. Uh, if it becomes really a tug of war, a lot of times I can at least convince the insurer to go to a lot more um, days of outpatient physical therapy. You know, all right, well, if you're not going to give us any more days as an inpatient, give us a 30 day day program and 100 outpatient visits. And of course, it's a back and forth, back and forth uh, until we come to an agreement. Um, because one of the things they do now is um, I'm going to go through with the external appeal process. And when you go through the external appeal process, when I put all of that in my appeal, everybody who reads that appeal, because they're not with that insurance company, they have nothing to do with it, they see the problem and they'll generally agree. Uh, so it'll serve one of two purposes. It'll either keep the patient as an inpatient rehab uh, for a few more weeks or you know, hopefully sometimes a month, or if we have to discharge, discharge with better benefits. Um, so that is, it's really important to know that part of your policy. Another thing to look out for is exclusions and policies. Um, I am starting to see some very strange exclusions. Um, I had a gentleman who was injured hang gliding and they, um, the insurer tried to say that he does not have coverage because uh, any accident due to recreational injuries is not covered as per our exclusion. Well, I got the policy, I found no such exclusion and we fought it and fortunately we were able to win that. Um, there have been some exclusions in there for DUIs, uh, things like that. And um, I still would try to fight it, but I would rather at that point know that we'll have to go against, uh, we'll have to start using their Medicaid coverage. Uh, another thing with private health insurance is the deductibles have become outrageous. So that is one of the reasons why it's important to get Medicaid as quickly as possible if someone is eligible for it, either through community health choices or uh, Medicaid as part of the Affordable Care Act, uh, because then Medicaid will pay that $10,000, $7,500 deductible. And the family, you know, I don't know many families that have that kind of money that can pay it. Um, Medicaid will also pay co-pays and uh, that can also add up to a lot of money for individuals. So it's another important reason why having private health insurance and Medicaid work so well together. Uh, each policy now has an out-of-pocket maximum that when you reach that out-of-pocket maximum, you no longer have any more co-pays, co-insurances to pay. Um, however, uh, not all insurers are very good at be about keeping track of that out-of-pocket maximum. So when we look at people's medical bills and we realize they have met that out-of-pocket maximum, then any other bills that they get we have to make sure that we send them back to the provider and back to the insurance company and tell the provider the insurance company is responsible for this. The patient has met their out-of-pocket maximum. Um, and we do all of this for patients. Um, I know that when my father was injured, I don't even remember days that I brushed my teeth. 
and it's just so overwhelming trying to do the care. Uh, so we try to take as much burden off the families by fighting some of these things that we can fight for them. Um, and you know, hopefully it makes a difference in their stress level and being able to enjoy time with their family. Um, internal and external appeals process. Uh, for anyone who has ever gone through an internal or an external appeal, generally the internal appeal starts with the peer-to-peer -peer review where your doctor will be speaking to the medical director of the insurance company. Um, a lot of times patients win right there and they get the additional coverage they need. Uh, if that is denied, then they're usually told to file, follow, file, I'm sorry, the family appeal. And the family appeal has to be written very carefully. Uh, some people that I've met just write a letter, it's medically necessary, therefore you have to provide the coverage. Uh, that doesn't quite cut it with the insurer. So we go back and look for the reason why the insurance company is uh, not going to provide any more benefits. Uh, generally, they will say it's because they are no longer medically necessary. So the first thing I do is look up the definition of medical necessity in the insurance policy. Uh, that will have a few bulleted points and there are very few times when their denial due to medically necessary will stand. Um, so that's the first thing we fight them on. The second thing that I fight them on is what's called clinical policy guidelines. And that is not part of your policy. These are internal guidelines that your insurer uses to deny your benefits. Uh, if anyone's ever gotten a denial, it may say, according to our clinical policy guidelines, you do not meet the criteria for this level of coverage. Well, I'll go in and I'll review what that clinical policy guidelines are, and they're not easy to find. Um, insurers were supposed to put everything online and make it easily accessible, uh, but lately uh, you have to dig really hard to find them. The other things that I do is um, I get studies that will support whatever we are looking for. Um, if we're looking for additional inpatient rehab, there are a million studies out there that will support that and they're peer reviewed. So the insurer really can't say, uh, these are not peer-reviewed studies because I'll ge generally give them all of the backup data with them. Uh, fortunately, my daughter is a veterinarian at Penn, so I have access to their medical library and could find any study anytime. Um, the other thing I'll do is, and this is something insurers never expect people to do, when they do their denial letter and they say it does not meet the clinical policy guidelines, they will reference certain documents, certain um, articles in journals that are supposedly supporting them. However, when I go in and read them, a lot of times they say exactly the opposite. So when you bring that to their attention, you basically have won your appeal. Um, and these are just, you know, I know that the average person does not have the time for these things or the resources to get to a medical library and look these things up. Uh, fortunately, all my kids are grown and out of the house, so I have plenty of time on my hands to uh, do these on exciting Saturday nights. Um, if a policy, as long as a policy is not self-insured, there has to be an external appeals process. Insurers do not expect people to appeal decisions. Generally, they will expect maybe the peer-to-peer -peer review uh, because your doctor probably also is incensed that the insurer is cutting back on your benefits. Uh, but 
trying to put together a family appeal and getting that to the insurance company is often difficult. So I usually try to start the appeal process even before, if someone has just entered a rehab, I'll generally try to start that appeal process early, looking up what the um, certificate of coverage is, looking at the clinical policy guidelines, and pretty much preparing in my mind what needs to be challenged. Um, by doing that, we have everything ready. So the day that they deny the benefit, we file an expedite it uh, first, a second level of appeal. Uh, you're, um, as a family member or as the patient, you will not be responsible for the charges while that expedited appeal is being heard. Uh, we have a very short window of time to get it into the insurance company. Uh, so that's why I try to get a lot of them prepared in advance. If we lose on that level, then I try the external expedited appeal process. Uh, most insurance companies go by these statistics. Less than 50% of individuals will ever file an insurance appeal. Of the people who file the insurance appeal and go through the peer-to-peer, -peer, about 70% of those patients will win. If they file for the next level, it's about 80%. When you get to the external appeal process, about 95% of claims are approved. And that's a huge difference. And it's just a matter of persistence, um, being a pain in the neck, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's about being that person that never gives up. So that's pretty much what I look for on the private health insurance side. Um, and then um, and just some other things that we do um, before I get to the conclusions and hopefully leave a little time if somebody has questions. There's a lot of other programs out there um, that families can benefit from. If someone is declared disabled by the Social Security Disability, uh, and they have federal student loans, federal student loans are forgiven upon total disability. Um, for anyone who calls Fannie Mae or whoever their federal student loans are through, usually the first response from the uh, student, for, from the uh, company is, uh, well, we'll just take it out of the social security disability check. Uh, no, the loan is supposed to be forgiven upon total disability. So we send in those documents, we send a copy of the Social Security Award letter, and we get those student loans forgiven. Um, other things that a lot of people are not aware of, um, especially in um, the housing area, and this is probably one of the best kept secrets um, in the federal government. And it's the Rural Development Home Program. And when they say rural development, they're not meaning out in the middle of Bradford County. I live in Collegeville and we are part of the USDA Rural Development Area. And it's nowhere near, <laughs> you know, there's no cows in the field or anything like that. Um, but under this program, um, we can generally get people in homes much, much cheaper than we could possibly even find uh, rentals for them. Uh, the first program they have is called the Direct Loan Program. And if you are very low income, uh, these programs are geared towards either disabled or elderly. Uh, the USDA will write your mortgage and they will pay part of your mortgage payments, kind of like the way Section 8 housing works in cities. So a lot of times uh, if, say we find a house for $100,000 and the person's payments are going to be $700 a month. But when we take 30% of what their income is, 
uh, that's only $400 a month. So they will pay the 400 and the USDA will pay the additional 300. Um, I have used this program over and over again, and I can't even begin to tell you how many lives have been improved because of this program. No one ever advertises it. Uh, you have to really dig in the USDA documents to find it, but it really does work well. They also have something called the Guaranteed Loan Program. And that would be for someone who is, doesn't fit that very low income bracket, but maybe a little bit higher. And under that program, the USDA does not pay part of your mortgage. What they do will, uh, they will not charge you closing costs or down payments, and they will extend the years of your mortgage to, um, I believe, um, an, an additional six months, if I'm not mistaken, uh, so that to keep your mortgage payments as low as possible. Um, that's called the Guaranteed Loan Program. And they also have a repair and rehabilitation program. Uh, you can get a grant if you are low income. Uh, you can get a grant to do modifications to your home. That's kind of why I like re watching it. It's like every time I watch it, I see something new. Um, so that's a great program. If you are over 62 and are low income, you can get a grant up to $7,500 to make modifications to your home. Um, and both of those are really great programs. So it fills a gap that uh, is difficult uh, for most people to get through in the housing market. Uh, right now, Section 8 housing has probably a 15 year waiting list. Uh, Pennsylvania Housing or Philadelphia Housing Authority has I'm, I'm guessing at least a 10 year waiting list. Um, they are trying to build more accessible, affordable housing, but uh, there will, there's just not enough to go around. And it leaves a lot of people uh, in living situations that aren't safe, or sometimes they're just stuck in a nursing facility because there is no place to go. So, <laughs> Um, just to let you know, everything we do is absolutely free of charge. Uh, we are funded through a private foundation. Um, we work with children and adults. Um, even though we initially began as Tri-State for PA, New Jersey, and Delaware, uh, after about two years of running this organization, that kind of went out. Uh, and we work a lot with people in Maryland, Florida, Georgia, you name it, Hawaii. <laughs> um, so whatever state somebody's in, we're always happy to see what we can do. Um, if you just have questions like, well, I'm in this predicament, what can I do? We're more than happy to answer those. Uh, we are not attorneys, so we can't do any legal work for anyone, uh, but we are happy to help. And we also do social security disability applications. Um, we do not charge. Um, I know a lot of people who go to uh, attorneys do have to pay for that, but we do not. Um, and I have a pretty good track record, I must say, for social security disability applications. I've only lost one in the application process. Unfortunately, it was my brother's. But, um, you know, there's, we, um, are really conscientious about what we put in the application to get across to whoever is reviewing it at Social Security to make sure that they realize um, all of the levels of functional impairments that an individual has. So I guess that's about it. Um, I look forward to hearing from anybody. Uh, as, oh, I know, and one person did send in a question about uh, Medicare for all. Um, we personally do not do legislative work, um, but I think COVID is going to change a lot of things in this country. Uh, only 39 states expanded Medicaid when they had the ability to do so. 
So we have people in all these other states who have lost their health insurance uh, because of all the shutdowns and they haven't been able to go back to work. And I suspect in the next year to 18 months, there are going to be huge changes in uh, a public benefit system. And I do think that we're probably going to go to an all public benefit system. I don't see where we have much choice at this point. Um, uh, healthcare is just too expensive for the average person to afford. Um, and as we know, anybody can lose their job at any time, um, you know, COVID uh, or even non-COVID, you know, with the company that's closing. Um, one of the other things that um, I have noticed over the years is Medicare is also trying to cut back. Um, they have started a program, which to me makes absolutely no sense, but they are reimbursing skilled nursing facilities more money if they do not provide therapy. And I have no way of comprehending where that is a good plan, um, but it, it is happening. Um, so, you know, I think that we will see more changes in the Medicare program, um, Medicaid program, hopefully Pennsylvania will be able to keep the level of services um, that we have. And one of the reasons why we have such good community health choices is because we have that PH95 loophole for children. Um, my patients in uh, Maryland, uh, we could get them on Medicaid if they're low income. Uh, the only way I can get them home and community-based services is if they go to a nursing facility for 90 days. Um, and that's really very unfair, but uh, their problem is they have no other programs for children with disabilities, and that's where they concentrate most of their funding. So, Beth, anybody? 